Okay, look, I might get started even though we're just on time because uh, uh, this is going to be a very exciting session and we've got uh, three wonderful speakers. Uh, but before I start on that, I just want to, as, as our custom, it is very appropriate uh, to acknowledge uh, the country. So RMIT University acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the university stands. And RMIT respectively recognizes the elders past, present, and emerging. So I'd also like to introduce just quickly uh, my co compare uh, Dr. Toll, who will take over, as I said, in the gap uh, that I have to go to the RMIT Awards ceremony. Look, I'm really excited about this uh, forum, which uh, the Materials Australia, Victoria and Tasmania branch is hosting. It's taken a while to get to get it up and running, um, but it's a really good one. In fact, it's my favourite one this year. Uh, we're going to be looking at the next generation of material reforms, a revolution in design and fabrication. And we've got three wonderful speakers, Associate Professor Roland Snook, um, who not only in the professor in the School of Architecture, founding partner in the experimental architecture practice, Kukugra, but also does some really wonderful work uh, using additive manufacturing to develop both new architectural and artistic forms. Then we have Dr. Yu Yong Tang um, from Monash University, doing work at the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department, looking at new technical issues and ways to produce forms. And then um, from Maple Glass Printing, uh, Dylan, now Dylan, I'm going to find it's hard to pronounce your surname, but I'll give it a go. Dylan Varopoulos. Um, That's pretty good. Thank you much, Dylan. That's looking at untapped areas of the glass industry and building disruptive technologies such as 3D printers to find modern sustainable solutions. So thank you all three. Look, this is really good, I think. Uh, we have a chance in this century to make new forms in ways that we haven't made up to now, in fact. So this is truly a revolution. Uh, at the moment, it's a revolution in the laboratories, but with Dylan's and others' work, it's actually going out in the community. So looking forward to seeing where the new frontier is. So having said all that, uh, we will pass on to you, Roland, and I will mute us so you don't have to listen to this background noise. Ivan, thank you very much for the invitation to be here um, and for, um, for the introduction. Um, so as Ivan introduced, I'm, um, I'm an associate professor in the School of Architecture at RMIT University, um, where I run a research lab called the Tectonic Formation Lab. And the Tectonic Formation Lab, um, in the broadest terms, we explore the design implications of emerging technologies. And in particular, the technologies we look at are um, computation and algorithmic design and robotic fabrication. And we look at the way those two things um, come together to be tested through something we describe as um, tectonics or architectural tectonics. And, um, and this is, I guess when we talk about tectonics, we're talking about the relationship between, um, between form, structure, um, material, um, and sort of connection and assembly. Uh, the lab has um, nine full-time researchers. Um, and this is our space over at the um, Design Hub Building 100. Um, it's sort of um, continuously accreting more and more of these, um, these prototypes that we make. Um, but to talk about the research in a little bit more detail, these two halves, the algorithmic half of our work looks at two main types of algorithms. One is a, a multi-agent algorithms, um, and second, uh, machine learning algorithms, in particular reinforcement learning. In terms of the robotic fabrication work that we do, we, we set up a robotics lab um, 10 years ago with an ambition to try and work out what we could use industrial robots for in terms of um, architecture and building construction. In the last six or seven years, we've really narrowed it down to almost exclusively working on um, additive manufacturing. And a lot of this is trying to take additive manufacturing techniques that exist and scale them up so we can use them at an architectural, architectural scale. 
Um, for many years, this is the predominant method has been um, FDM, large scale FDM printing using um, this KUKA robot. We've gone through a series of um, extruders to try and print parts of buildings. This is a part of a building we printed at Monash University. Um, this is now about five or six years ago, um, printed polycarbonate and more recently projects at RMIT University. This is in the, um, the Brunswick campus. Um, and also these works find their way into, um, they sort of demonstrate it, find their way into galleries. So th this was a project that we uh, developed for the National Gallery of Victoria. Um, it's made from about 70 of these um, 3D printed panels. Each one is about 1.8 meters tall. Uh, and so in a way, what we're trying to do with this type of project is demonstrate the architectural implications and also show what can happen when you start to scale this work up um, um, and enable people to imagine how this could be used in terms of architecture. So I'm showing you that to give you sort of an overall background of what we do. Um, in fact, there's a, couple, there's a few other slides I want to show quickly. Um, a lot of the work we've been doing with 3D printing has been with originally with virgin plastics. More recently, we started to shift to print in recycled plastic and also print in wood bioplastic composites. Um, and so this project is uh, a wall system we're developing, which is printed in um, timber bioplastic composite. Um, so it's biodegradable and it has a, a core material of mycelium rather than using a petrochemical foam. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a fully biodegradable interpretation of a, um, a sandwich wall panel system. Okay, so I just want to quickly touch on the type of algorithmic design process that we work on. Um, this is a process that I describe as behavioral formation. So it draws from the logic of swarm intelligence and operates through multi-agent algorithms. And it's an approach where it's a generative design approach. So it's an approach where instead of trying to design or draw a model architectural forms, we're writing the underlying rules for those forms. And we're writing those into a series of agents interaction of these computational agents that leads to a self-organization and the generation of emergent proto-architectural forms and structures. Um, some of the screen grabs from the software that we develop. And I guess a lot of the challenge for us is how do we take these types of highly intricate complex geometries and realize them in real material? And that's what really what a lot of the work in our lab is about. It's about how do we make that translation? And um, at a small scale, that translation is quite easy. This is um, this is an aluminium SLM print. It's printed um, by the AMP at RMIT, um, Milan Brandt's group. Um, and but it's a very fine, very high resolution project where each of these lattice members is about 0.4 millimeter across. It's made up of 1.1 million agents. So it's a very sort of high resolution type of geometry. And while this works very well at a small scale, our ambition is how do we scale this up? And how do we start to um, you know, realize this at a more architectural scale? So that's perhaps the smallest object we've, we've made. Um, and which brings me to the question of tectonics. And I'll talk through this briefly, but um, in my architectural practice, the first 10 years of my practice was really doing algorithmic work. And about 10 years ago, we were making uh, images like these, or images of things that we see as parts of buildings, sort of, um, proto-architectural chunks, I suppose, but we had no understanding of how you might build these. And so I guess the last 10 years of my career has been working through a whole series of ways of attempting to build these kind of geometries. And in doing so, we're both pushing forward design as well as construction techniques. And we're interested in what is the feedback between these. When we first started doing this work, we were, this was about 10 years ago, we were looking at fiber composites and the way we could in, embed these types of algorithmic patterns into um, as core material into um, fiberglass. We tested at a series of different scales. And a lot of these, as I said, were tested originally as um, in galleries, art galleries and museums. Uh, we worked on flat sheet material, which could then be um, riveted together, which would then start to generate its own curvature. I guess um, a breakthrough for us was doing this in fiber composites. So this is a project in which the black carbon fiber is laser cut from sheet. Um, it generates its own curvature as it gets connected together, glued together, and then um, has a thin layer of fiberglass that provides all the shear um, 
structural logic. <clears throat> and then other types of projects where we try to make these sort of thick fibrous geometries, but by using, in this case, rods. And these are a series of rods that are bent by robots. This is 270 rods that were bent by, by two little robots in one day. Um, um, so we went through basically the whole series of these, um, these experiments and we call them demonstrators. And each one I, had a certain type of failure and would lead to the next. And it became a sort of evolutionary process. But I want to pause and just talk through um, two projects uh, or two types of projects that explain where we're at currently with this body of research. And one of these is about the way we use carbon fiber to reinforce plastic. So the large scale plastic prints that we're doing are not particularly strong, quite heavy. They're, um, and they require um, a second level of, of structure. So we've been working with Boeing for the last about five years now on a project which is about infusing carbon fiber into 3D printed plastics. Um, and this was our first demonstrator of that in 2019. And it's a, it was, part of the Shenzhen Arctic Biennale. It's printed with three types of layers, a sort of external skin um, and a series of internal layers, which end up with a carbon fiber, a series of carbon fiber conduits. And in designing this project, we're interested in, in the way um, structure and surface begin to, um, to interact. And as you move around the project, um, the structure comes in and out of focus. In the section, you can see the way this is working. Um, the black is the, the middle layer. Um, then there's a foam insulate or foam um, core material. And then at the very center, these conduits are where the carbon fiber is infused within. Uh, this is the second version of this type of, um, type of project. Um, this was installed at the National Gallery of Victoria about a year ago. Um, and it's made in sort of five large, five large pieces, um, which were printed on, on this robot out of about 15 pieces that got um, milled and glued and assembled together. This gives you some sense of the um, printing quality of that. This is one of these parts once it's been post-processed and milled, it then gets assembled into these larger, these five larger chunks, um, five larger assemblies. And then a few photographs giving you a sense of, of what that's like on site in terms of the way light reflects and refracts um, through those structures. Uh, that project was also an opportunity to test out our latest research, which is in wire arc additive manufacturing. So this is a, um, uh, a metal 3D printing process, which is effectively a MIG welder on the end of an industrial robot. And we printed these a series of um, structural brackets that connect between concrete base and the carbon fiber and plastic. Um, I guess you could describe it as a sculptural object. We don't really think of these as sculptures. We think of these as being proto-architectural um, fragments. Um, so this is the last thing I want to talk about today, which is um, the WAM printing that we've been doing. Um, this is, we've been working on this for now about um, four years. And our early attempts um, were relatively crude. And it was a lot about just trying to, um, to understand how we can control the material and this realization that the most complex part of this is, is the writing of the software. Um, about uh, a, just over a year ago, we embarked on this project. This is a digital render. Um, and we were asked by an industry partner, um, Eureka and Thermax, to try and um, to demonstrate what's possible um, with this technology once we start to scale it up. So this was a collaboration between the lab and Formex and Bollinger Grumman, who were the structural engineers on this project. This is the piece once it's been printed. So this is the largest um, metal WAM printed piece that we've made to date. Um, it's about three and a half meters across. Um, this is some of the prototyping, early prototyping work we did. Uh, you can see here that it's printed, um, it's quite thin. It's a sort of four millimeter wall thickness. It's printed in 1.4 millimeter layers. Um, printed out of mild steel. Um, that gives you some sense of the, the print quality. A lot of our work has been about how do we refine this, um, this print quality and make it um, uh, make it a fine enough print quality that means we don't need to come back and do subtractive machining on it. Um, again, it was printed, well, this was printed in 15 pieces. 
which was then welded into four larger assemblies. And those larger assemblies are mechanically still bolted together um, to make the, the final object. In the details, you can start to see um, both the kind of print quality there, as well as the way this jointing detail works. Um, on the bottom left of the screen, you can see that's one of the mechanical joints. Um, whereas some of these other areas that have, have welded joints. This was exhibited in March at the uh, Melbourne Design Fair. Um, and that's um, a photograph of, in, our, in our workshop. So I think that's probably all I've got time for. Um, but I guess what I wanted to try and show today is a strategy of work, which is not about um, uh, purely about material innovation or about um, fabrication process or about design as discrete things. But constantly what we're trying to do is we see these as being um, tightly interrelated. And with each, um, I guess, design innovation we have, we require a new type of fabrication technique or a new material for that. And then as we start to develop those techniques, those material and robotic techniques, we start to find new potential design applications for them. And so we see this as a, a sort of evolutionary, um, evolutionary process. Um, all right, I'll leave it there. Um, Ivan, do we have time for a few questions? We do, Roland. Uh, two or three questions, particularly the technical questions. We'll get into the, the philosophy at the discussion at the end of the section. But if anyone has a couple of uh, technical questions, uh, please jump right in. All right, so I'm going to be the engineer, Roland, although I actually love your stuff for its uh, architectural and artistic forms, but uh, wham, um, lots of defects. Um, how do you control tensile strength, et cetera, et cetera? So how do you deal with the, the engineering issues with wham if it's going to become an architectural um, material? Yeah, okay. Um, so I think a lot of additive manufacturing is used in very high-end applications which require um, very um, precise production quality. Um, so, you know, often it's used in, in aerospace or um, these types of high-performance applications. Architecture is very different. I mean, um, architecture has a wide um, tolerance built into it. And so um, we don't do any analysis on sort of the microstructure um, or any sort of you know, CAT scans of these things. What we do do is we, we print a whole lot of pieces that we mechanically do mechanical destructive testing on. And so we can get a whole lot of data off that. And one thing that we've realized from doing this is that the, um, the results we're getting are almost identical to hot rolled mild steel. And so I guess what we've, we've become convinced that um, for the purposes that we use it for, um, we can do all our engineering, all our FEA modeling based on um, hot rolled mild steel and the, um, uh, the WAM prints perform in a very, very similar way. Great answer. Okay, any any other uh, technical questions for Roland? Yes, one. I, I wonder how you deal with uh, corrosion. If the things are sitting out there, do they go rusty or do you have a, a treatment at the end? Oh, that's a good question. Great. That's what I would have asked, but I didn't want to be monopolizing yeah. Roland. Uh, excellent. Look, it's a good question. Um, we've, it's something we've just been dealing with. Look, we, we started printing in mild steel because we knew it was the easiest thing to print in. Um, and we wanted to, I guess, explore um, what are the geometric possibilities of this first. Um, I think that what we'll end up doing is our next prints will be in stainless steel and we're also doing some experiments in printing bronze. Um, but for this one, what we've done is it's just been, after it was printed, it's been rubbed down with um, Penetrol and then it's been clear coated with a, um, a two pack epoxy resin. Um, so the clear coat is almost, I guess almost invisible, it makes it slightly shinier. Um, it will only probably give it about five years of, of protection um, for exterior, but um, yes. So I guess it's, a, um, it's not a particularly sophisticated way of dealing with it, but I guess that our ambition with this was, um, was to try and see what was possible relatively quickly before we start working on, um, on metals that don't have problems with the corrosion. Thank you. 
Thank you. And rather than, of course, uh, my colleague here, Dr. Toe, is an expert on corrosion in additives. So uh, come and talk to her if you need any more advice. Um, so let's move on to Dr. Dr. Tang, if we can have your, uh, your piece now, that would be wonderful. Yes. Hello. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Thanks for inviting me for this great event. My name is Yunong. I'm from the Monash University. As you see, actually at Monash, I'm working for both two, two departments, mechanical aerospace and material science. And uh, yeah, my background actually is from mechanical and uh, developing a CAD software. And uh, also working on the area of the design for additive manufacturing. And uh, my today's topic is about uh, digital materials. And uh, we see that uh, the digital materials fabricated by additive manufacturing actually will open the door for the future of the product design. This is a, a quick outline of my today's presentation. First, uh, I will give you a quick talk about uh, what is the digital materials. Actually, uh, with the help of the additive manufacturing, we can control, like the digital additive, additive manufacturing actually is a type of the digital manufacturing process. With the help of this uh, unique uh, manufacturing process, we can control the materials micro or mesoscale structures and uh, can achieve a wide range of the mechani mechanical and other type of the physical property of the materials. And uh, so we define the digital material as the type of material whose micro or mesoscale structure can be accurately controlled by the digital manufacturing process. And uh, here in, on this slide, I show you some typical actually digital materials. First of all, it's a lattice structure here on the, on the corner. What we can control for the lattice is we can control the topology, the uh, connectivities, the porosities, and all other things and to achieve the different uh, properties. And besides control of the lattice, we can also use a kind of the, like polyjet manufacturing process. It's a one of the additive manufacturing process. We can control the material distribution like voxel by voxel. By doing that, we can achieve some like uh, architectural materials who can achieve the property that the normal material cannot achieve. And we can combine the matte scale material complexities and with this type of the matte scale matte material lattice structures. And for the fiber reinforcement uh, material, we can further control the fiber orientation as you see here and further enhance the mechanical performance of the structures. For the metals, and uh, if we control the process parameters, and we can achieve for the same compo composition, we can achieve the functional gradient material with the different uh, microstructure, the green size orientations on the different layers. So this is a, a type of the like the material. Digital material is not new material, but it's just a, a way how we control the micro or mesoscale structure of the materials. Why we need the digital materials? Here I give the like summarize the three major reasons. First of all, like it open a design space for us to further control the microstructure of material for its tailored properties. For example, this is a typical of like a digital architecture materials. It is a biomimetic uh, material trying to mimic the, like the, the bone or the lacquer, which is a very hard material in natural. And it's a combination of the soft and hard material try to increase the, the, the fracture toughness of the material by combination of the soft and the hard materials. And uh, yeah, for the composite structures, as we see, yeah, recently we have a lot of research on these areas. And if we can control the fiber orientations in the structures, we can digitally control its orientations. And then with the same like uh, number of the like fiber volume contents, we can further enhance the, the stiffness as well as the strength of the structures. And another thing that uh, actually, if we can have the material with the matte scale complexities, and uh, we can control its matte scale complexities, we can further enhance its uh, like uh, mechanical properties. This is the example that uh, we can have the like a uh, laminate uh, layered materials, and uh, on each lamina we have the like soft and hard material combination, and it can further improve its uh, like impact resistance. So, for the Digital materials, the, in my group, and I started research from my PhD. And first of all, I started research in the additive manufacturing of the lattice structures. And uh, when I started my research in 2017, and at that time, there's not a lot of software that can design lattice uh, structures, which can combine the different type of the topologies and uh, also the resistances. And we decided to uh, develop our own software. 
And uh, we did a group to develop the so a software called Intranetis, which is in the Grasshopper Rhino. It can be considered as a computational design tools to support the users to design a different type of lattice structures. And uh, we have the, for example, uniform lattice and conformal lattice and also a random lattice. That, and for the random lattice, we can further control, for example, the distribution of the pore size. And uh, also recently we developed some algorithm to control the orientation of the random cells and also control the size of the random cells on the different regions and then try to simulate to the humans. For example, like for human's bone, it's uh, made of the random form, but it's not purely random. Actually, the, the strat will uh, follow the certain uh, statistic distribution. We are trying to follow that rules and then de develop some algorithm to have the really like not just a random, but uh, also like a biomimic uh, uh, lattice structures. So based on the uh, lattice, uh, interlattice we developed and uh, we have a lot of uh, different de design applications. One application is that uh, we apply the lattice structure uh, for a lot of different type of the structure design. We use the optimized topology optimization algorithm to optimize the lattice rib densities. For example, this is Jorid lattice and uh, we can have the different lattice rib densities and we map in the topology optimization result to the lattice rib density. And we see that uh, it can further enhance with the same mass, it can further enhance the mechanical properties. And also we find out the lattice, uh, like a different type of the lattice structures, they are not isotropic material, they are they're orthotropic, if they have the orthotropic symmetric. And uh, it really enlarged the design space. We developed a database to support the designer to select the, the correct or the right type of the lattice topologies for their applications. And another application we recently working on is the using a lattice structure for the customized or the personalized product design. And this is a, a example of the shoe sole. And for this shoe sole, conventionally we do the design of the shoe sole just to, like customize the, the shape of the product. So the shape of the shoe sole will conform to the cu customers uh, like a scanned foot. But uh, we do one step further. We also optimize the, the lattice the porosity distribution. And uh, we use the, the machine learning algorithm, uh, especially for the, it's a surrogate model to do optimization of the lattice the infill. And then we want to try to further minimize the uh, peak planter pressures, the pressure on the bottom of the feet by optimizing the lattice infill in different regions. And from this result, as we, yeah, we show that if we apply the different lattice, the porosity on the different region, we can further reduce the peak planter pressures. So at the end of my talk is that I want to quickly summarize the, the opportunity and challenges. And uh, yeah, first I want to talk about opportunity in these areas. Like with the help of the additive manufacturing, it really enlarged the design freedoms, uh, help us to control the like a meso or microstructure of the materials. Significantly enlarge the design freedom. Actually, we can further push forward the boundary of the property of the space of the materials. If you can remind, if you can record a memory about uh, like the HB shard, we still have a lot of empty space that in the material HB shard, we can try to, by controlling the micro or mesoscale structure of the material, we can try to push our boundary. And another one is enable the core design of the process property and the structures. And the additive manufacturing is the, somehow is a very unique compared to conventional manufacturing. If we apply different process parameters, we can control the microstructures. If we apply the different tool paths, we can also control the, the microstructure or mesoscale structure of materials. So the design of the like product the fabricated by additive manufacturing is more complex than the, however, it uh, also provides us more freedoms, the opportunity to further enhance the performance. And another thing is that digitalization of the material, I would like to see it's a, a future trend and can help us to build a thread, digital thread of the design product, support application of using AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm to support material designs. Yeah, that's opportunities, but we also find a lot of like uh, challenges currently. Uh, actually recently we see a great progress that uh, yes, a lot of like a uh, software company realized uh, that uh, that is, is really important and some software company like Ontoporch Hypergenic and develop their solutions for the design of the lattice structures or lattice materials. And also I uh, did my PhD and I've been invited by PTC to give the talk to them. And this also you see that the big cat companies they also have the lattice modules. However, we find out uh, like uh, those software are primarily focused on the lattice design. 
but cannot be efficiently used to design other, other type of like digital materials, for example, composites, uh, also other architectural uh, materials. And we also see that in larger design space can definitely like uh, help us to give us the freedom to improve the mechanical properties, improve the physical properties, but also bring us challenges for the like optimization algorithms. We have a large number of design variables. And the third, the, the, the fourth one is the mechanical modeling, uh, especially for a lot of like uh, heterogeneous or the functional graded materials. We can no longer use conventionally for the composite material. We use the homogenization techniques. We think about uh, on the macro scale, we think it's the homogenized materials. But uh, with the function graded the digital materials, the homogenization techniques uh, may no longer valid because the, the periodic boundary condition cannot be like uh, satisfied. And so we need a new like uh, advanced uh, uh, mechanical modeling or the simulation tools that can help us to predict the performance of the digital materials. And also we see that a new standard need to be developed to support qualification of the digital materials. And that is, is a good example that uh, after colleagues working in the different field, for example, aerospace biomedicals, and uh, we have a lot of discussion about uh, how can we just uh, develop the qualification standard for that is, can we develop something like a geometrical dimension tolerance to like uh, measure the quality of the lattice. So we make sure that uh, the design and fabricated product can meet the customer requirement finally. So at the end, I want to share a little bit of our recent work that uh, we are trying to push forward about the CAD, uh, like the research in the computer aid design, and want to enable the existing commercial CAD software can deal with the, the function graded digital materials. And uh, yeah, recently we developed a concept called the digital uh, material template. It can be considered as if you are familiar with the conventional CAD softwares, and we use the feature to modeling the geometries. But uh, here the idea is that we also want to have the same feature, but not modeling of the geometry, but also modeling about the mass or the microstructure of the materials. For example, we can modeling about the lattice and we can control the lattice like the roof density. And also inside of the lattice, and we also have control those short fiber orientations on the different regions. And we can use the, the feature to control those distributions and further improve the performance of the products. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about my talk. Thanks a lot. And if you have any question, let me know. Thanks, Rinlong. Um, Ivan has gone to collect his, uh, his prize, so I'm taking over for now. So thank you for the talk. Do we have any questions for uh, Rinlong? Hi, I'm um, Olga, and it's uh, I don't have a question, but I have rather a comment. So thank you very mm. much for a very nice presentation. And um, I actually wanted to say that um, I work on the process structure property simulation at the level of microstructure and uh, micromechanical modeling. So mm. it might be nice to connect and collaborate on that following your yeah. talk. So I will yeah. drop you a short email, so thank you. Yeah, sure, Th thanks. And uh, yeah, we, we can have a talk uh, yeah, after this event. Uh, yeah, we can like exchange yeah. emails and uh, hope we can have a collaboration in this area. Yeah, perfect, thanks. thanks. Awesome. Um, I myself, I have a curious question. So <clears throat> you did mention that uh, it's uh, the method is only av av available for lattice and cellular materials right mm -hmm. now. It, have, you, have you tried? Um, exploring outside of that, or is that are there works in the literature doing that right now? And also, what kind of what is the range of materials that this is applicable for? So, say for example, metals or plastics. Is there is there a limitation to that? Uh, you you mean the digital materials? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I I like to see there's no no limitations, and uh, we try about uh, the uh, the polymers. Yeah, for polymers, and uh, we try about uh, those type of the short. Uh, or the long, this one is the example about a short uh, fiber reinforced composite. And we have the short fiber inside. By control the process parameters, we can control the like the fiber orientations. And uh, so what we do is that the first we design and uh, yes, we design the design distribution and then we convert it into the like a manufacturing tool pass. And then we generate to actually generate this kind of the distributions. And for metals, it's also applicable, but for metals, it's more complex because the, actually for the metals, we can control the like the pressure parameter, for example, the laser, like power, 
like scanning speed, we can control its cooling rate. After we control the cooling rate, we can also control the, like the microstructure of the materials, and we can achieve the function graded materials using just the, using the same powder, but we can achieve the functional graded material with a different type of the like microstructures. Awesome, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? If not, thank you for a very interesting talk in long. We'll move on to Dylan. No worries, I'll share my screen now. Awesome. Screen two. Um, okay, can you guys see all that? Can you see my screen? Great. Um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending uh, this workshop. Um, and a big thank you uh, to Ivan uh, for uh, for putting the entire event uh, together. Um, I'd first like to just quickly begin by um, acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land. Um, I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, as they looked uh, to repurpose and reshape glass waste into something useful for their communities, I think that we can take some inspiration from this. So, as you guys have all uh, been in attendance tonight, um, a, 3D, a 3D printing is a huge part of next generation uh, material forms and manufacturing. Uh, lots of materials can be 3D printed, but until recently, uh, one material has been lagging behind the rest, and that's glass. Now, uh, glass is a special material with very unique intrinsic properties. Um, it is, it's, it's also a material that is accumulating in landfill at a staggering rate. Um, so since it's so highly recyclable, it's wasted potential in uh, sitting in landfill. Uh, this is why a company that I work for called uh, Maple Glass Printing uh, decided to develop the world's first uh, commercial glass 3D printer and bring another material into the arsenal of additive manufacturing. So uh, Maple Glass Printing is an Australian company who spun out of Monash University uh, mid-2020 in the midst of the pandemic. Now, uh, we are based in Northcote, uh, Victoria, and we've also got an R&D team in Canberra. Uh, Maple Glass is on a mission uh, to disrupt the linear life cycle of glass products uh, by recycling and 3D printing with 100% waste glass. Uh, not, now, not only is diverting waste away from landfill and into a circular system, but, um, but it also unlocks new possibilities uh, for glass manufacturing. So uh, there are two major processes uh, which play a big part in this mission. Uh, the first is the filament uh, fabrication with the machine we call the vitro glass. And the second is the 3D printing with our latest printer called the Maple 3. So the vitro glass is responsible uh, uh, for the recycling. Uh, you input uh, your glass waste and it outputs glass filament uh, ready for 3D printing. Um, our filament is pulled into the form of a glass rod, which is 3.5 millimeters in diameter. You begin by setting the firing schedule and once initialized, the vitro glass will automatically cut and pull your glass filament into your desired length and diameter. Uh, this machine uh, can manufacture um, hundreds of meters of filament uh, within, uh, within a day. Now, I typically work with soda lime glass as this is most commonly found in landfill. So for certain glass, uh, such as bottled or container waste glass, uh, your settings must be dialed, uh, dialed in to avoid uh, crystallization as this glass is unforgiving to work with. So uh, the picture on the right, uh, that's, uh, that's the container glass. You can see um, it was pulled from a wine bottle, uh, the blue of the blue filament. Um, and out of focus in the back, the green and the brown filament uh, was pulled from, um, pulled from uh, beer bottles. Now on the left is a different type of soda lime glass, uh, which is called bullseye glass. Uh, this is primarily used by glass artists. So we regularly, um, uh, we regularly head down to our local glass art studio to collect their waste and 
off cuts and we recycle it for them as they prefer to work with virgin material. Art glass such as bullseye or gaffer glass is much easier to work with uh, compared to the container glass as they have a specific working range that has been engineered into them. I like to compare this type of glass to PLA in the polymer world of 3D printing as it's more beginner friendly. So since glass filament is extruded through a nozzle, this enables for features like retraction movements and color changes. Uh, printing FDM uh, style also opens up the door to co-extrusion possibilities down the track. So on screen here, um, I've got a video up close and personal with the glass printing process. Uh, this is the bullseye glass, as I was talking about before, uh, with a one millimeter layer height. Um, so in the nozzle, the glass is exposed to high temperatures for, for a relatively short amount of time. This means the vitrification and temperature working range is less of a concern compared to other glass manufacturing methods. So this means it's, it's easier to recycle. So while the nozzle is typically set to 900 degrees Celsius with the art glass, uh, the actual heated chamber is set uh, to a kneeling temperature. And this is a huge advantage of 3D printing glass as while the part is printing, it is relieving internal stresses and being annealed at the same time. So this leads to a very important uh, consideration when 3D printing glass, and that's cooling the glass bead that is deposited uh, layer upon layer. So unfortunately, you can't just install a little plastic cooling fan um, uh, from Alibaba and aim it at the glass within the kiln. And that's for obvious reasons. Um, additionally, glass is sensitive to thermal shock. There are, however, clever printing techniques and software settings which you can employ to combat uh, this challenge. For example, on screen, you can see a project that uh, we recently uh, completed alongside uh, Foster and Partners. Uh, these pieces are now on display at the Royal Academy of Arts uh, Summer Exhibition in London. And these parts were designed as an open face uh, surface. So using a spiral mode for these prints meant uh, once a layer was completed, it, it would reverse direction and print the next layer. But due to the overhangs at the end of this tool path, uh, cooling the glass became an issue. So um, employing software settings such as coasting um, and, the, and the ability to retract and travel enabled us to work around these cooling issues. More so, uh, the quality of the 3D model and the digital design becomes an important factor as this dictates what the tool path can look like. So uh, this is where new and exciting software programs like Full Control G-Code Designer can be so powerful. Uh, they allow you to create the exact tool path specific for your part to obtain geometries in very efficient ways. Now for slicing programs, this is a little bit different as they generate a generic tool path based off of an algorithm. However, slicing programs are becoming smarter by the day with new features like Arachne perimeter control uh, this feature reduces the need for gap fill and small extrusions through modulation of the line width. Um, so basically this, you end up with a, um, a being able to achieve um, higher detail in your prints. Although you can, although we can print a glass infill and removable uh, support structures, uh, designing around this greatly improves part quality and efficiency of the entire printing process. Uh, so once these things have been considered, you can 3D print glass geometries that otherwise were very challenging, expensive, or require uh, years of glass working experience. Features such as square corners, internal structures, hollow sections, um, and geometrical um, uh, accuracy and repeatable parts are quite challenging for glass artists to produce. 
Um, additionally, uh, the layer lines allow for unique surface manipulation. So as you can see on the right here, um, we've achieved a, 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 a textured surface with our, a, a, textured, a textured surface, which, which otherwise would be very difficult uh, to obtain. So overall, 3D printing glass is applicable to the following industries. There is heavy interest in 3D printing glass facades as modern designs can be easily prototyped and manufactured. Additionally, this will increase the volume of glass waste being diverted away from landfill. So currently we are in the building phase of scaling up and developing large format uh, glass 3D printers for this very reason. This technology is also being used by universities and businesses uh, uh, for many different uh, research purposes. Um, as you can take a CAD model and create a glass test sample in the same lab in one day. So ultimately, this technology leverages the synergy between glass manufacturing and digital design, allowing you to input uh, waste glass and reshape it into complex geometries with great artistic or um, architectural expression. Um, so, I guess to end things at you know um, at uh, part at uh, Maple Glass Printing, we're very excited to see how makers around the world um, it, it can give glass another life, to give glass weight another life rather by 3D printing it. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Dylan. That was really exciting and uh, lots of forms I've never seen before. So <laughs> I guess that's what the whole workshop is about, new forms as well as, as new materials. That's right. Um, that's just um, any, we're going to jump into our panel discussion, but before we do that, any particular technical questions for Dylan? <coughs> Hi, Dylan. I've got a question. I just thought I'd want to ask you. No um, with your uh, your three D printed products, have you done um, thermal shock testing on those compared to, say, you know, just any other glass product you'd normally buy? And how do they compare? Uh, yes and no. Um, so I guess um, official testing. I would say we've actually got a project uh, coming up uh, very soon where we will be doing some official testing. Um, however, just uh, during the process of learning to 3D print glass, you're exposed to thermal shock, whether you like it or not. So, um, for example, removing uh, parts out of the kiln too, uh, too early, um, that exposes the parts of thermal shock. Um, in the video clip I showed um, earlier in the presentation, we we're printing uh, with the kiln completely off, actually. So, um, in that uh, clip, um, uh, the the glass part of the, that's being printed, I guess, right there is being exposed to thermal shock. Um, but in regards to any figures or numbers, I we don't have any of that at the moment. But something that we're super excited to explore. Thank you. Great. Um, look, we're going to now skip from the technical and then go into the more broad discussion. Um, I actually am here because the award certainly happened earlier. So, uh, um, but so I'll co-chair this with uh, uh, my vice president. Um, now, um, I know that Roland loves philosophy, so we get some philosophical questions in here. That would be good. But I start with one broad one, and this is just a little bit of a slightly, a slightly, oh, not antagonistic, but you know, one of those sort of questions just to get us started. Um, look, I work it out as a manufacturing, so I'm only criticizing myself with this question, but uh, sometimes additive manufacturing seems a bit like nuclear fusion. It's going to be the, the best technology for the future, but the future is always somewhere in the next 20 years and it never seems to arrive. Um, so are we getting somewhere with additive manufacturing and its ability to form new materials and forms? And are we getting somewhere out of the laboratory and actually into putting the new forms into service in our community? Um, I'm going to start with Roland on that one and then, then move through our speakers. 
Uh, is it like nuclear fusion or will we actually get there sometime? Uh, look, I think it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, it's um, 3D printing is always promising something um, and not necessarily delivering. Um, I guess a lab like a, like my lab, um, we are much more interested in in application and getting it out of the lab and into onto the building site as quickly as possible. And so um, now, admittedly, most of what we've done is rel relatively small, um, but we've managed to um, build a few parts of permanent um, buildings. Um, and one of those that I showed, we didn't actually print. One of those, um, we found an industry partner. Um, we set up a robot in their factory and um, basically got them set up with our software so they could print it. Um, so I think, that, you know, we, we're certainly committed to um, translating these technologies into industry and, and getting them used. Will there be wide, their widespread application? I guess one of the things that we realized when we started printing with WAM is that it's very inefficient to print with one robot. Um, like we realized that our, currently our labor, um, the cost of our labor is about 10 times the cost of the machine time, the materials, the consumables for it. Um, and what we, we realized we need is we need one person operating five or 10 robots not one person operating one robot. So there's a, an issue of scale there. So I think that um, if we're gonna try and make these things um, applicable to real world projects, and in my case, that's, that's buildings, um, it takes a certain amount of investment from industry to, um, to scale this up. So I think scale is the key issue. It's not the, the technology is mature enough. The technologies I was showing are mature enough to use in buildings. Um, the scale of fabrication becomes the issue. So, Roland, when are you going to move to China? Because you could get that scale in China. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's probably true. Um, and it's not not a huge investments. I mean, the the WAM cell that um, I was showing is um, is only a hundred thousand dollar cell, um, and so it's not it's not particularly expensive to set up. Okay, let's move on. Um, uh, Yong Lang, do you have an answer to that provocative question? Um, how long do we actually get there and start producing these components in industry or the community? Yes, I, I think that uh, like uh, for industry, uh, as we all know that uh, yes, some industry already use some of the additive manufacturing component. For example, in 2019, I have designed a conformal cooling of the injection uh, as a die casting mode. And it has been already used in industry for the mass production. And however, we see that uh, still uh, a little bit a big barrier for the wide adoption in the industry. I still remember that uh, in uh, 2013, when I started my PhD, and uh, the first half year, I summarized some like uh, idea about design for IT manufacturing. I talked to the chief engineer in the Pompadia Aerospace. I talk mm -hmm. about uh, how to use uh, like a top optimization, use a lattice structure to optimize the aircraft component. And at the time, he told me a story that uh, he told me that, you know, you know, that for aerospace industry, like uh, we like to use the new technologies, but uh, the robustness and is the most important, the safety is most important for us. And so he want to know about, uh, yes, that you can improve your design, you can improve your materials, but how can you like guarantee or qualify your materials? In uh, 2019, uh, uh, 2018, I have been involved in a very big international project uh, with some uh, aerospace companies, and uh, we used the additive manufacturing to repair the turbine blade of the aircraft engine. And we do the fatigue test, and we have the 10 samples. Nine samples passed the test, but only one cannot. And uh, we don't know what, what yeah, we, we investigate about, about material, like microstructure, we find out some difference. But we don't know where where the difference is coming from. I think that uncertainty now is the like one of the major issues that uh, especially for those like industry which have the need a very critical like a component to play the critical roles that uh, they are not one hundred percent trust about additive manufacturing. And uh, yes, that's also our research like uh, like uh, direction in the future. Uh, take lattice as the example because I did a lot of research in the lattice structures, and currently we don't have any like a standard to, for example, 
to measure the quality of the lattice. And uh, yeah, especially for the for, for biomedical, uh, I talked to some uh, biomedical company who printed the bio implants. And uh, we, we don't know, actually we know we can use the micro CT to do the scanning, but uh, the, 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 yeah, how can we like a quanti quantitatively describe the micro CT data compared to the design data? And based on those comparison, we can predict the, the for example, performance variations, that's still a gap. I think that uh, if we want to really push this one to the industry and wide adoption in the industry we, as academic, and we really need to think about how to solve those gaps. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, now, going on to Dylan, you actually are a commercial company, but some of your examples seem to be prototypes of artworks. How close are you to uh, entering the, the larger markets? Yeah, so I think um, um, like added, additive manufacturing as a whole, um, I like to look at it as just a tool. So there's lots of other tools which can be used as well. Um, and right now, like for example, um, our latest printer, the Maple 3, um, we've used some of the parts, um, a 3D printed metal parts. We've got some 3D printed uh, polymer parts too. So uh, for some sections of the printer, um, you know, it's a great tool to employ. Um, and like, as you mentioned, the future never seems to um, arrive. I love that. And, um, and I think that that's a great thing because everything's changing really quick. And I think 3D printing in general is moving really quick at the moment too, where, um, where there's lots of non-technical people getting into 3D printing, like they're even selling 3D printer um, at, uh, at uh, Aldi, for example. So, um, but in regards to glass at the moment, it's, um, it's still a very new technology or it, um, it's still a new tool. So it takes a little bit of time uh, for people to get experience with the tool and learn to use it inefficient and effective ways. But um, of the past uh, six months, uh, people are really starting to want to use the tool and really starting uh, to want to learn it. So um, uh, yeah, like there's some exciting things to come, that's for sure. Well, th thanks Dylan. I'm going to pass over to my uh, co-chair. And by the way, she is using uh, Audi type printers to print parts for our electrochemical robot we're, we're building. So uh, I think in terms <laughs> of plastics, we're really there and using it as, a, as an actual manufacturing tool. It's the, it's the metals, I think, that we've got a, a bit to go. We're using it for implants, obviously, but for wider applications, a bit to go. But now, um, uh, is there anyone from the audience that has a, a question like, like to ask? Um, if not, I'll pass on to my co-chair to uh, take over the, the questioning. Yeah, so just to follow up, <clears throat> I think all three of you would agree that the um, uh, additive manufacturing is going somewhere in the future. I would like to know from each of your point of views, what will the future of materials look like in specifically maybe in your own industry? So maybe Dylan, you can start first. Could you repeat the question again, please? So you're saying um, like in regards to the materials that we work with? What so would... what will the future of materials look like uh, in terms of maybe people taking up taking the technology or uh, how would workplaces look like? How, yeah. How, yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I think right now we're um, like, we're still quite uh, fresh, like despite even 3D printing being around, you know, uh, since the eighties, um, I think we're still quite fresh. Um, uh, into it at the moment and at the moment like we've got uh, specific printers that specialize with one material another specific printer that specializes with another material and they all specialize in their own unique areas their own um, uh, their own unique uh, scales um, as well so I think uh, looking at it as a whole um, I would like to see in the future a, a bit of a mix of all where, where maybe a machine can start to employ different uh, materials, maybe through co-extrusion, um, and maybe that'll mean composites, um, whether that's with uh, different types of materials or maybe maybe like you're interwining uh, glass fiber and co-extrusion that with, with, a, with a standard glass bead as well. 
So I think there's still lots of, uh, I think that there's still lots to come um, in regards to materials. That's great. Um, what about Yunlong? Yes, I, I also think that uh, I agree with Dylan that uh, actually the future of the IT manufacturing, we still see that uh, like more and more different type of the material can be used. Like originally it's from the polymers, as we all know, and then like uh, into the like uh, metal ceramics. But uh, I would think in the future it's more about the combination of the different materials, for example, about the ceramics with metal. We see some published publications in these areas. Also, we see some uh, polymers with the fibers, polymer with the maybe the glass and glass with the polymer. It's kind of like a mix of them. And uh, yes, the, actually the beauty of additive manufacturing is the, like the bottom up manufacturing process. And uh, with the base material by like a controller, like a tool pass control the fabrication styles and uh, we can have a very big like design freedom in the materials design space. And uh, we can design a lot of like, a, it's a not totally new material, but it's a kind of like a new like combinations and achieve the new properties. And it can give about, a, like in the past, I always say in the past, uh, it's uh, in the product design. And what we do is that uh, we select the material, we use HB chart, we select the existing material for our product design. And I would like to see with the help of IT manufacturing in the future, it's kind of like we design our customized tailored materials and for our customers, for our product. It's a combination of the geometry design with material design together. Yeah, I think we're getting lots of ideas on you know the opportunities within additive manufacturing itself. What about you, Roland? Yeah, well, I guess I'm, I mean I agree with this idea of hybridization. I think there's a lot of um, hybridization of different um, printing techniques. Um, I guess within architecture, concrete printing is now relatively mature. I mean, there's been there's a plethora of concrete printed buildings that have um, occurred over the last decade. Um, I think there's been a lot of work in plastic printing that we've been a part of, large scale plastic printing. Um, but I think we're going to see a shift away from that. Um, I mean, people tend to hate plastic. Um, and I can see there's a shift away from that, I think, into an interest in printing with, I guess, more traditional architectural materials like um, um, like steel. And, you know, it's very exciting to see what maple glass are doing in terms of um, glass and the way that might become an architectural um, possibility, I guess. But the other thing is around um, bio biodegradable materials and um, biological materials. And I think these are becoming more and more um, important in the, in the discourse um, and actually have quite a big impact on the type of forms and structure that can be designed. And so we're starting to see a lot of work with 3D printed mycelium, for example. Um, I think there's a whole, you know, a whole range of, of these types of materials that are um, uh, becoming increasingly important and increasingly, um, you know, a key part of the, of the discussion. So I want to ask the next question since we haven't got any questions up in the chat, but please audience, um, this is this is supposed to be a multiple forum, so we'd really welcome you either putting a hand up or putting a question in the chat. But I want to take what you just said a bit further, Roland, and I want to be as my as I like to be slightly provocative. Um, look, I've worked around the building industry for a very long time. My first job at Australia was in building construction engineering in SIO back in 1990. Um, but we're still making buildings really the way we were 200 years ago. Um, the basic structures and forms have not really changed for a very, very long time. Now, I'm not an architect, Violet, so you can, you can shoot me down on this, but as a building scientist, I don't see much change. So, and I would love to. So I guess the, the provocative question, that's the provocative part. The, the, the question is, you know, where would you like to take material forms in, in some really new, interesting ways rather than just sort of reprinting what we've been doing with traditional forms? What are some really new, exciting possibilities in the type of forms that we can now make rather than replacing old forms with new technologies? I'll start off with you, Alan, because you're, you're getting into it in the last part of your last answer. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I entirely agree with you. The building construction industry is the slowest industry I know of to adopt new technologies and adapt. Um, I mean, it's an 
incredibly frustrating to be um, an architect who believes in innovation um, to be working in this in this space. And I don't come from a background of um, of fabrication. I come from a background of of algorithmic design. But I've moved into robotics and fabrication simply because nobody's capable of building the things that I want to build. Um, so, um, so that's I guess one. I mean, I agree with you. Um, where do I think? I mean, there's an example. I think I've probably talked to you about this example before as well. But <clears throat> I always cite this example of the first iron bridge that was built in 1770s in the UK, and the first iron bridge was built with it looked like a timber bridge it has timber detailing um in this bridge and basically it's this example where architects and engineers have a in that case you know a new material application but they end up using it just to replace the material that's already there yeah it's a slightly stronger version of the material but nothing changes and it takes a long time for in that case um, bridge design to evolve to make steel bridges that are you know fundamentally different and I guess this is, you know, what I see is the role of a lab like mine. It's like, we are trying to work out what is the architecture of 3D printing? Like, how is it going to be different? And um, some of the differences that we see are um, a compositing of uh, architectural roles. Like often in buildings, um, there are different objects or different pieces of geometry that have different roles. So for example, you have a column, which is dealing with vertical load, for example, or a beam, et cetera. Um, but they're doing one one job. With 3D printing, we see an opportunity for a much more sophisticated set of geometries which can negotiate between a whole lot of different things. Like we, we're designing buildings now where the shell of the building is, I mean, it's structural, it's also the facade, it's ornamental, um, it's spatial, embeds a whole lot of different uses in a single thing. And so that's where I see one of the potential directions um, where um, the freedom of 3D printing will enable a different way of thinking about architectural form. So I, I muted myself. That was, yeah, I'm glad you agree with me. And I, I like the way you, where you want to go to. So that's, that's, that's a very reassuring answer. So um, let's go to Dylan and then we'll go to Yong Yang on the same question. Where do you want to take forms and what new forms rather than reproduction of old forms can we hope for? Yeah, um, I think that Roland answered that question really well. And um, it's uh, and also going back uh, to Yan Mung, um, I really liked his take on um, on rather than uh, selecting a material for a certain, I guess, application, you select maybe a prop, you know, like the properties which you require, or maybe you know the um, like the boundary conditions and these properties and selecting those properties then with some uh, with some very clever software, uh, the material um, uh, can be, I guess the material will be produced dependent on those properties. So um, I don't really, um, honestly, um, have too much more to um, add. I think Roland did a really good job of answering that. Yeah, he normally does. Um, <laughs> let's, let's move on and see if, if, if Yong, Yong Long can give us a, a, a different aspect. Yes, I, I think Roland uh, have covered most of them. And uh, yes, the, my my thinking was my understanding about that is that I think that like the additive manufacturing can provide, as I mentioned before, it provides the freedom on the on the materials. So maybe it can bring more like interesting materials inside of the civil inside of constructions. And conventionally, we use the wood, we use the steel. How about can we use the recycled polymers, glass, or the fibers? And uh, we printing some structure instead of like uh, use the, like uh, the, the standard components. And can this save the time? Especially another very interesting just to fly into my mind is that uh, recently, I, I, I don't know whether you have seen that yeah. news that uh, they use a drone to do the printing. And uh, so it, can, it means that uh, in the future, if we want to like travel to moon or Mars, and we can also use additive manufacturing and we use the material which available in Moon on Mars and do the construction. That's will be very interesting. And here, for example, in Australia, if we have some localized materials and then the beauty of additive manufacturing is that it can be like tailored 
for the localized material. So we no longer need the material which from the other countries, for example, China, US, or Europe. And uh, maybe I would like to see it uh, can further, like uh, it's better for our environment. We can save a lot of transportation, like uh, energy consumption. Okay, thanks very much, Young. That's a, that's a great answer too. So we're gonna have the last question from the audience. Um, so Igor has posted a question. Um, so his question is, how much traditional manufacturing do you think AM can ultimately replace? AM strength seems to be in its versatility rather than in mass production. So uh, I'm going to go back to you on this one, Dylan, since you are the, the manufacturer amongst the three. Um, do you see your technologies replacing mass manufacturing or is it always going to be a specialised tool for versatile objects? That's a great question. Um, and um, and in short, I think no uh, for right, of, I guess for, for the near future, um, uh, because as I mentioned before, it's just another manufacturing tool. So um, I think a lot of people uh, think of 3D printing and additive manufacturing as the future. Um, and although that's really exciting, um, I think right now it's still just a tool. So um, at the moment, a lot of its uses, at least for glass, is uh, bespoke uh, pieces, uh, rapid uh, prototyping, uh, customization, um, those type of things. Um, if you want to, there's no point, um, I guess, recycling all of this waste and um, um, with these, you know, like even if your processes are very energy efficient, there's no point recycling and just 3D printing glass wine bottles again. So um, I think it's just a tool. And um, like, as you said in your question, uh, uh, versatility um, over mass production. All right, so uh, Yongyang or Roland, would you like to add to that question? Yes, I can quickly add some of my thoughts. And uh, definitely I don't think that uh, additive manufacturing will replace the other manufacturing process. Yeah, kind of we see that uh, the post uh, front comes for additive manufacturing. And uh, most of like existing part, especially used in the three is a combination, it's a hybrid. For example, like uh, uh, the, in, uh, the die casting mold I designed for industry, actually is uh, fabricated by additive manufacturing just for the internal cooling channel. And uh, the outer surface, we still need uh, the sense of machining because of the surface qualities. And uh, yes, I, I would like to see in the future, it's more like the combination of the multiple manufacturing process and uh, then we can achieve the, the product we want. As to the uh, manufacturing for the mass production, I think this question is a little bit tricky because uh, like uh, I think in uh, 2018, I have attended a conference and uh, uh, there is a seminar from the like uh, the vice president from GE who used uh, who mentioned about uh, in US they have a big factory about uh, five or one thousand I, I I forgot the exact number I think it's a one thousand machine which can do the like the they produce the, the the aircraft engine nozzle and they can produce the thousand nozzles in one day. So it seems that, uh, yeah, as Roland said, that if we do the scale up and we can still use the additive manufacturing for the mass production. And uh, however, I would like to see the cost is very expensive com com compared to conventional, like mass production method, like injection molding or other, other process. So Roland, do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, um, I was very skeptical when I started working with additive manufacturing. I never really thought it would have a serious role um, in architecture because I always assumed it would be too slow and too expensive um, to work at the scale of buildings. Um, but I've completely changed my opinion on that. Um, and maybe to use WAM as an example. Um, so one is that maybe you don't need to print everything. So we've been doing some projects, I didn't show it today, but projects where We've been taking um, sheets of metal and laser cutting them and folding them and then printing onto them. And so the idea is that we print the complex bits and we cut and fold the simple parts that, with this idea that not everything is complicated enough that it needs to be 3D printed. Um, so that's how we started using WAM. Um, 
But then as you can see from that last project I showed, that whole project is, is way unprinted. Um, it took quite a while to print. It took about three months to print. Um, but we've calculated that the capital cost of using our robot cell is only $1.25 per hour. Um, and considering that, you know, it's just using rolls of, um, of welding wire, um, which is also very cheap. Uh, the, the actual cost of producing parts is remarkably cheap when you compare it to the cost of um, skilled laborers, skilled welders fabricating steel for, for buildings. So I actually honestly believe that I think that um, things like WAM printing is going to be the cheapest way of doing anything that's sort of marginally complex in terms of steel fabrication for at building scale. So um, uh, yeah. I think well, thank, thanks, Roland. That's a very positive answer. I want to use my provocative as chair to add into this question, and then we'll then we'll, we'll do a quick summary. Um, a couple of things. I totally agree with what you just said, Roland. I think there's a whole opening in hybrid technologies, part additive, part traditional, um, and I think that we can get a lot by thinking about the best way to manufacture something, and not necessarily saying additive versus traditional, but combining the two. Um, there are also areas where additive manufacturing and uh, Yongang pointed that out very well, confirmer cooling. So that's the additive manufacturing of the dyes that we then use in plastic mass production. Um, so again, you're combining technologies, you're combining uh, mass production with additive by, by printing confirmer cooling into the uh, mass production tools. And the, the last one is when I was at Cyro, we, um, we ran a sand printer, 3D sand printer, which was really good at making uh, the moulds very efficiently and uh, very versatilely. And then those moulds were then used for mass production of the components. So it's not necessarily one or the other. You can have hybrids and you can have hybrid in the process as well. Um, I want to draw to a close. I found that really exciting. Um, I love the forms that were shown and I love the mathematics and the process shown. We're going to have this in two years' time, or maybe three years' time, and we're going to we've recorded this, so we're going to bring you free back, and we're going to replay the records and say this is what you said in 2022. It's now 2025. Where have we got to? We may or we won't do that, but this is this is what I want to do at the moment to see whether the the brave new world we're talking about takes one step more forward by then or not. Um, I think I. I, I sort of deliberately chose uh, these three leading speakers to span sort of the artistic, architectural, the scientific and the manufacturing. And I think you really played off each other and gave different aspects. And I hope I found that exciting. I hope the rest of the audience found it exciting as well. Um, so um, at this point, we're going to close, but I'm going to give my, the last word to my co-chair. Um, would you like to add anything to the discussion? My co-chair doesn't. So in that case, thanks very much, Yongyang. Thanks very much, Dylan. Thanks very much, Roland. I hope you enjoyed uh, the conversation as much as